Welcome everybody to, to the, the third in this series. Um, I'm, I'm Richard Barker, uh, fellow board member along with Ndidi of the ISSB. Uh, delighted to be uh, following on from Lucretia and uh, from Ndidi in this series. Very mindful that um, Ndidi is our Africa expert, right? So, so I'm providing some sort of um, ISSB input here, but, but uh, very much within within her guidance. Um, so, uh, do you, Lucretia, you want to say anything at this stage, or I just want to come back no, in? No, 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 Richard, go ahead. Okay, so let me um, share some slides with you here. My remit is to go into uh, some, some depth on S1 and S2, um, but I thought, I would, I would resist the temptation to go straight into too much depth and, and instead try to, to make a bit of a connection to what's already been uh, discussed in the first two sessions and to, to put some context into, um, into, into an African context for sustainability reporting. So um, we are in, you know, the ISSB is in the business of global standards, but of course the context in which those standards apply differs. Um, and understanding uh, it to the African context, I think, is uh, is important in, uh, in in the why do this? You know, what, what what is this for? What's it trying to achieve? And and how should therefore should we should we be thinking about it? Um, I think this is really important because sustainability reporting means different things to different people, um, and and investor oriented sustainability reporting means different things to different people as well. So, getting us onto some sort of a, a common page to start with, I think, is important. So. Um, so just a few slides um, by way of introduction, um, and let me just set these in, the, in more in the broad context of sustainability. So um, perhaps the most obvious frame for sustainability is the the, uh, the UN SDGs, um, the Sustainable Development Goals, which are focused on on human rights in one way or another. Right? You know, they're focused on um at rights of, of no no hunger access to fresh water gender equality and so on and so forth and um and they're also focused on economic development and on the conservation of natural resources to to that end essentially of the quality of of human life and the uh, this resonates in in the uh, in the african context more so than it does anywhere else um so um, his you know, just illustrative data on on uh, extreme poverty globally, and you see the concentration in the in um, in sub-Saharan Africa in particular. So that's the SDGs. Um, meanwhile, um, the um, sorry, the, the the a second version of sustainability is um, also from the United Nations is one of not over-consuming. So the definition of sustainability given by, by Brutman, perhaps the best known definition of sustainability, meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs, um, essentially is saying um, the current generation uh, is, is, is fine to, to, to consume the, the yield of the capital that we have, but not to consume the capital itself, right? Not to compromise um, future generations. Um, and in this regard, there is a, a pattern of economic development, which is the same in, um, in Africa as it is anywhere else. Um, but at the same time, the African share um, in uh, impact on future generations has been uh, historically very low. Um, so um, this is a long run uh, time series of, of, um, of annual CO2 emissions. And what you see on the, the green line for the world as a whole is a is a sort of a, a pickup from almost zero around about the time of the Industrial Revolution, uh, around about the time the corporation as an entity came into existence, around about 1850 or thereabouts. And then a gradual increase in the 19th century, an increase in the rate of consumption in the early 20th, and then a massive increase in, um, in emissions in the second half of the 20th century and, and um, associated with rapid economic growth. Uh, the current position is that Africa is represents around about four percent of global emissions, so it's pretty tiny. You know, in in the um, in the picture of what's 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 causing the sustainability challenges that we are facing, um, 
the uh, Africa in a sense is, is, is last on the list, right, in, in a good way. Um, however, um, the pattern of development in Africa, as I mentioned a moment ago, is, is the same as it is anywhere else. It's just on a smaller scale. So again, you see on this chart, um, the uh, emissions from the Industrial Revolution being sort of very, 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 very low. Uh, industrialization, industrialization and economic growth starting somewhat later in Africa and the, the, the total level of emissions remaining very small, but the rate of change being very similar. So in a sense, the challenge of sustainability, the challenge of, of satisfying the SDG ambitions of um, uh, avoiding poverty and, and so on and so forth, um, whilst um, avoiding the uh, depletions of environmental resource, of global warming and other natural resources, um, is a is a story which is which is a, a, a very different in an African context, but which also shares some of the, the global um, issues. So um, here's another way of looking at this. Uh, this is uh, tropical deforestation, um, and you see so you know impact on natural resources. Uh, sustainability is not just a climate issue. Um, depletion of nature is every bit as as serious in terms of sustainability of economic activity. Um, the Amazon gets all the attention as it as it should, but but Africa is is um, is not that far behind in in in, de in, in tropical deforestation. So um, you have the same impacts of economic activity um, that that um, uh, to some extent the rest of the world is facing, and of course um, the rest of the world by by having um, developed sooner and faster, and especially in in, uh, in the global north. Um, we are collectively in a place where net, a transition to net zero is needed. Um, and uh, if you look at this, this chart, this shows you um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions over time, historically, and where they are projected to go in the future in order that we meet the targets that we need to meet. So um, the collective targets. Um, so, you know, you see this sort of... Uh, dramatic rise and even more dramatic expected fall. So this is the, 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 the future economic scenario that we collectively face. Now, um, if you put all of that information together and it's, it's, it's a lot in a very short, in a very few slides, I, I, it seems to me that the challenge, um, the, the sustainable development challenge from an African perspective and therefore the context for sustainability reporting, which I'm about to get to, um, is, um, in what ways can Africa um, help as a part of the collective reduction in the impact of, of, of um, on global warming and on environmental pollution, which is coming from outside Africa, right? So how, how does Africa help the world's challenges while at the same time enabling its own sustainable development? So you have the greatest need for sustainable development, but critically sustainable, because all the world's economies at this point need sustainable development. So, um, I think there are there are three issues that that where where sustainability reporting is relevant in this context. The first is um, the need for greater transparency of impact. So, to the extent that there is a uh, global consumption, global economic growth creates impact, whether that's on climate or on, or on natural resources or on or on uh, social resources. Um, there needs to be transparency on how that impact is felt. Um, that impact is felt particularly strongly in Africa. The future, of course, as, as is well known as well, is that the ability to, to, to adapt um, to the likely impacts of climate change and so on are lowest in, in Africa, but also Africa is at, um, is, is, is at greatest risk as well. So, um, so understanding those impacts and in some way helping to, uh, to, to mitigate them um, Second is making the business case for sustainable development. So um, it, it, there needs to be a, a reallocation of private sector capital in order to achieve the kind of sustainability transition that needs to happen. Um, in order for that for that reallocation of private capital, and, and the focus of, of the ISSB is, is private capital, um, there needs to be a business case. That's the way markets function. Um, the business case needs to be one for sustainable development. So the, the, the both the, the risk and the opportunity here is um, for Africa to, to, to leapfrog, to jump ahead of the rest of the world and not to, to go through the, 
um, particularly damaging, environmentally damaging phase of economic development that has been a, a, a blight on uh, global economic development. Um, and making the business case uh, means resulting in uh, results in, in capital reallocation, hopefully, right? So worst case scenario is that a, a focus on sustainability diverts capital away from Africa rather than diverting capital towards Africa where the need is greatest to close the gap on the sustainable development goals. So you have all these tensions that all, that, that, that all come together. And, and in my mind, that put, put Africa right at the heart of, um, of thinking about um, sustainable development. If we don't get it right in, you know, collectively, if we don't get it right in Africa, then, 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 then game over. So in that context, um, what role uh, accounting standards or sustainability reporting standards? Um, the first role, at about, again, a very high level in, in response to the first of those three issues is the need for high quality data that is complete, that includes all, all um, impacts, so impacts and all impacts, that is comparable across different, different jurisdictions, different entities, and that just, that, that's disclosed to a global standard. So um, you, you need to be able to compare data on a global basis. Companies are going to be reporting on, on a value chain basis. In order to do that, you need information collected in the same way in different jurisdictions. I think mean, that's, that's a no-brainer. Um, Second point is then, then you need to somehow be able to translate sustainability-related data into financial consequences of business. In other words, make a business case. So traditionally, sustainability reporting has been all about just reporting impacts. It's been all, all about saying, you know, the, the business affects environment and society in the following ways, um, and it should disclose that and in some way be accountable for it. Um, if you want to attract investment into sustainable development, um, in a way that that, uh, that that addresses the SDGs without uh, making the, um, uh, the the challenge of climate and natural resource worse, um, sustainability related data need to be translated into into financial consequences and, and made into a business case. So there's a mindset change away from thinking about corporate social responsibility reporting or sort of greenwashing type reporting, and instead thinking about why should this attract money. And why should this attract the investment that's needed? Um, and then the, the capital reallocation requires communication to investors. So the role of our standards, um, and this kind of it, it, this this has to work, right? The role of global financial reporting standards, uh, alongside the challenge of sustainable development in an African context, I think is summarized by by those bullets. Okay, that's the context. Um, and I describe all of that because I think the context is is really important. Um, and because I think that uh, we need to understand why why this is being done. Um, this is not reporting on sustainability for its own sake. This is not reporting in order directly to influence public policy. Um, this is reporting to investors in order to make investment decisions. But those investment decisions need to be aligned with sustainable development and therein lies the challenge. So ideally, there's a win-win, right? Ideally, it's in the best interests of corporates um, and it's in the best uh, to report transparently to investors and it's in the best interest of investors to be able to invest in um in in sustainable development okay so uh we have two standards and and uh, Lucretia and Adidi have both mentioned uh these two already um the reason there's two at this stage is, is purely uh, a practical issue. It, it takes time to write these things. And it's pretty obvious that we should have a general standard that covers, as I described, complete disclosure of sustainability related um, risks and opportunities. It's also pretty obvious we should have a climate standard. Climate is the, the, the single most important issue um, on which many other issues depend, right? So if you you know, worst case scenario of of, um, of climate in a in a in an African context doesn't bear thinking about, and so the, the focus on climate as issue number one is is paramount. Um, and S three and S S four and so on will 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 follow along in due course. So S one it describes sustainability related disclosure. It describes materiality as being material information for investors in making investment decisions. Right. So again, it's about attracting capital, essentially. Attracting capital for sustainable development is the issue here. Um, 
So investors are concerned with the risks and opportunities, and the opportunities piece is absolutely critical. You know, the uh, the future, a world which is which is a sustainable one is more valuable than a world which is not a sustainable one, right? So um, there must be more opportunities that, than um, than not in this space, as it were. That's the first bullet point. The second bullet point, um, we're applying the task force and climate-related re financial disclosure um, structure, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Third bullet point, we require industry-specific disclosure. Um, now, notice this, this, this is material information, right? So that we're not saying, here are metrics you must disclose. That would be a compliance mindset rather than a business-oriented mindset, an investment-oriented mindset. The focus is tell your investors what they need to know. And what they need to know is going to be different across different industries and may well be different for your particular entity. So re reporting material information means reporting, in effect, a distilled version of the information that's going to your board, right? Of the, the issues that are important to you in running the business. Um, final bullet point here is, is um, uh, S1 for everything other than climate, for which there's a particular standard. S1 refers to a variety of sources of, of uh, information and guidance for companies. I'll come back to those. Um, the general point to make here is that sustainability reporting is a relatively new domain. You know, so. It has been practiced for a long time, but but in, in its in the in the form in which it's now emerging, the level of of expertise, the, the depth of institutional knowledge, and so on is 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 limited. Um, it's critically important to get on with it, right? It's critically important just to start telling your company's story wherever you, you know, whatever stage in the process you're at. Um, so there is guidance to help with, in that process, but what there isn't is a right answer of here's how you must do it because there isn't such a thing yet. Um, practices evolving and evolving quickly. So don't feel that you're behind the curve, right? Because everyone's behind the curve in that sense. Um, so um, sustainability related risks and opportunities um, come from the environment in which the company operates. Um, it comes from under, you know, understanding your risks and opportunities, come from understanding the natural resources that you depend upon, the social context in which you're operating, and the stakeholders within with, with whom you engage. Um, up and down the value chain. So the scope of this reporting is broader than financial accounting, but it's not a dramatically different way of thinking about business, right? It, it's, you know, business has always operated in, 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 in a broader environment and has always had to understand stakeholder relationships and so on. So um, what's, what's different is not so much um, that breadth of, of information that's material for your investors. What's different is the, the sustainability transition you know, we are in a situation where the future of the world economy needs to operate differently from the, the past economy. Um, and so understanding that transition is, is, the, is the mindset required here. OK, so I mentioned I'd come back to the TCFD structure. There are four elements, governance, strategy, risk management, metrics and targets. Notice these are all um, related to what the business will do. Um, financial accounting is concerned with what the business has done largely. So corporate reporting, for the most part, has been concerned with, the, with reporting past performance. That's fine so long as past performance is a good indicator of future performance. Um, but in the, in the sustainability transition context, it might not be a good indicator of future performance. And so what investors want to know is how are you preparing for the future? Um, and again, don't think of this as some sort of mystical compliance exercise, which is it, it, it's not at all clear what you're supposed to do and how you're supposed to do it. This is a description of, as it were, normal business process, right? Do you have the governance structures in place? Do you have a strategy to address a sustainability transition? Do you understand the, the, the risks? How do you understand the risks? Are those embedded into your general risk management process? What targets have you set? Uh, what metrics are you going to use to measure progress and what, what interim targets do you have and so on. So the TCFT structure gives a very sort of market accepted, clear way of presenting how you are currently um, planning and thinking about addressing sustainability related transition. The kinds of governance disclosures are, are here. You know, um, so uh, what, what skills does your board have? How often do they think about sustainability issues? How do they task management? Uh, with with um, uh, with tackling them and, and so on. So this is not rocket science, right? But it's really important stuff. 
Um, likewise on strategy, uh, over what time horizon are you planning? How does your business look over those different time horizons? So in the short term, uh, what's already in your budget? You know, what are you immediately planning to do? Uh, in the medium term, what can you? What are you planning over the course of your strategic planning horizon? Maybe with a fair degree of confidence. Over the long term, what are the big picture risks and uncertainties, or changes in government policy and so on that you expect that will influence the risks and opportunities that your business faces? Um, and the, both S1 and S2 encourage quite a structured way of thinking about strategy and, and communication of strategy and the translation of strategy into um, financial um, uh, ways that investors can understand what they're planning to do. Um, targets, uh, I, I've mentioned already, now in order to communicate to a high quality consistently on a comparable basis, you need the standard to tell you how to define a target, how to measure progress against it, and so on and so forth. So what you find in our standards is the same level of rigor that you would expect to find in accounting standards. Um, so that we can ensure quality comparable data, but in this case applied to, um, to targets for the future rather than measurements of the past. Now, we have provided and we will be providing a lot more guidance for thinking about sustainability related risks and opportunities and how to report on them. Again, really important to stress that no company does sustainability reporting perfectly. It doesn't matter who you are or where you are um, or how big you are for that matter. And the important thing is that is that you report to the to the best of your ability, as it were, consistent with the the, the scale of resources position of, of your business currently, and that you get on the journey of, of reporting. Okay, so um, S two, the climate standard, um, is much more granular than S one. S one is is by its very nature very broad. S two is a, is an expansion of, of TCFD. Um, it must be used together with S1, right? So S1 des describes things like um, what we mean by materiality, which reporting, you're reporting for the same entity as financial statements, that you must provide industry disclosure and so on. But then S2 goes into much more specific uh, detail on climate-related disclosure. Um, I just want to mention, uh, in a sense, again, taking a step back, um, something really fundamental um, that many of you on this call will already be very familiar with, but others won't be. And it's important not to assume that everyone is on the same page, um, which is the most sort of basic measurement um, element of the climate standard, scope one, two, and three greenhouse gas emissions. Scope one emissions are those directly from your own operation. Uh, your scope one will be the, uh, the, the, the scope three uh, of, of others. Um, Scope two is, um, is something somewhat of an exceptional category. It's, it's emissions from uh, purchase electricity. So it's, in a sense, an extension of your direct operation. And scope three is everything else, right? Scope three is all the emissions upstream and downstream. If you are um, at the, 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 the early stage, <clears throat> the upstream stage of a value chain, then your scope one emissions are going to feed all the way down the value chain um, to... Um, to manufacturers and, and ultimately consumers. Um, and any company of any size for whom you are a supplier anywhere in the supply chain will be ultimately looking for information from you on your scope one emissions. Um, and I don't know. So the good news, uh, I mean, the energy efficient building with the lights go off if you don't move enough. <laughs> the bad news is the light was light went off. Anyway, um, so and to go through is all other emissions in, in, in the value chain. Um, now, no company has has perfectly accurate scope three emissions. It's it's an infeasible exercise now. It will become increasingly less, less infeasible over time. Um, for the time being, every company at some level or another is estimating its scope three. And our standards recognize that and encourage that. Okay, so don't be too, um, don't, don't make too many parallels between sustainability reporting and financial accounting. In financial accounting, the numbers have got to be right. And the rules are very tight, right? In sustainability reporting, you're estimating and you should make your best estimate. And if you're 
If you're a large multinational with very sophisticated systems, your estimate should be much better than if you're an SME that doesn't have those systems, right? But wh whoever you are, you should make estimates that are proportional to um, the position that you're in. You will not be able, ultimately, if you think about the bigger picture I started with, you will not be able to attract the investment required for sustainable development in the absence of being able to demonstrate these kinds of data uh, to investors. So, so we're all in this together in some sense. It's, you know, this collection of data is a really important exercise. Um, now, scope three is broken down to, to complicate life a bit further, which I apologize. Scope three is broken down to 15 categories. Now, again, when you're reporting, you report those that are material to your business. Um, in general, you're only reporting what is relevant to understanding the economic prospects of your business. And therefore, if you don't have um, estimated data on these things, either um, you're, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're overthinking or overestimating how much information you need to be able to provide, right? So, so bear in mind, it's only material information. Um, if it is material information and you don't have it, then you ought to have it, right? Because it's material information for running your business. So, um, so this should not be as, as, as daunting as it might appear at first sight. Think about it as authentic communication of your capacity to create value to your investors. Um, built into um, our requirements on, on S1 and S2, a, a variety of, of reliefs um, and guidance and support and so on. Um, so, for example, in the first year of applying the climate standard, you don't need to apply, um, you don't need to produce scope three data. Um, in the first year, you don't need to provide all of the S1 disclosures that, that, that complement and supplement the climate disclosures. Um, look to the third point here. This is super important. I've referred to it in many ways already. Use reasonable and supportable information available without undue cost or effort. That automatically builds the scale of your enterprise and the sophistication of your systems into the expectations of the level of reporting you're required to do. What your investors don't want is nothing. They don't want no information because you don't have perfect information. What they want is as much information as you are able to provide in order to, to, to fuel this funding of sustainable development that I started with. Um, also built into, into S2 are, are various considerations of different ways of estimating data and therefore um, different levels of quality of data. So good communication is not, um, here's my number, <laughs> it's, Here's my estimate, and here's the basis on which I came up with the estimate. 40% of it I'm very confident in. Another 40% I've estimated in the following way. The other 20%, it's, it's, I'm really unsure, right? That's fine. Um, so you're trying to communicate what you know as well as you know it. Um, this is true also for the scenario analysis. So we require in the, in the S2 what's called a scenario analysis, which sounds terribly sophisticated and difficult to do, and indeed done, done comprehensively and well, it is sophisticated and difficult to do, but it does not need to be done in that way. Um, so again, using reasonable and supportable information without undue co cost or effort might mean that what you're doing is a, is a, a qualitative analysis, um, simply saying, look, the world is on a transition to net zero. Here are various transition pathways. We've thought about those transition pathways. Here's how they affect our thinking about our business model. That's the scenario of analysis disclosure in, in, in a simple form. So we don't be intimidated by, by language that sounds um, aggressively mathematical or something. Um, one more thing to mention, and then I'll, I'll stop so we can start to, um, to do Q&A and so on. Um, interoperability is, is, a, is a word that has become very widely used. I wish it was not the case, but it is. Um, interoperability applies when you have uh, different sets of standards trying to do the same thing. Um, it's inherently not a good idea to have different sets of standards trying to do the same thing. And so time spent talking about and thinking about and worrying about interoperability is time not well spent on the whole. Um, with that in mind, um, the European standards and, and our standards overlap on climate. So S2 overlaps with ESRS E1, their climate standard. We have worked very closely with the EU 
to minimize the need for interoperability concern as far as is possible. So there's a very high degree of overlap between those two standards. Um, elsewhere, we have uh, sector standards to guide disclosure if companies wish to use them. Um, and ESRS has um, mandatory requirements across areas other than climate. So we don't directly overlap. Um, so much is made of, of the challenge of interoperability. Actually, if you go about telling an authentic sustainability reporting story for your business and, and, and use IFRS and ESRS as a guide, you, you're not going to get far wrong. It would be a, a very simple and high level uh, version. So let me stop there. Um, stop sharing and then we can open up for Q&A and let me invite um, Ndidi and Lucrezia back onto the call. Um, okay, first question. Given that resources are limited, do you think investment in emissions reduction would be a pr priority for developing countries like Africa? Well, um, you know, the as I've already mentioned, the emissions, the level of emissions in, in Africa, especially when you offset by the uh, by the, the availability of carbon sink in Africa, makes Africa a very small contributor to the global problem of emissions. So it's emissions elsewhere outside Africa that need to be need to be reduced. Now um, that said, as and, and as my my uh, chart of, of patterns of economic growth showed. The trajectory for Africa on a is is the same as it is anywhere else. It's just starting later. Now you cannot have um, the globe cannot have a continuation globally, not just Africa globally, of the uh, of the continuation of, of greenhouse gas gas increases that we've had historically. So you know, since the Paris Climate Agreement, emissions have just carried on going up. Right? This is this is this is not an option. The, the longer that remains the case the sharper the, the, the turnaround and the more unrealistic the turnaround to get down to 1.5. 1.5 is looking increasingly unlikely. Um, so the, the reason I'm saying that is the plan for the, for the sustainable development of Africa has to be a low carbon plan. So it's not so it's not reducing existing emissions, it's inviting investment on the basis that there is a, a, business, a business case, a low carbon case for that investment. And that, therein lies the opportunity to, to leapfrog existing uh, models of economic development in other jurisdictions. Uh, and Didi, do you want to do you want to add to that? Um, I, I think that there is also the precisely for the reason that you mentioned, Richard. So less than four percent of emissions are from the African continent, and yes, yet less than three percent of global climate finance flows to the African continent to address what are clear. Um, transition and um, mitigation and ad adaptation requirements. Um, so there is a gap there. And having the ISSB standards in place that are clearly addressing sustainability related risks, because again, you must bear in mind that seven out of 10 countries are African that are most affected by climate related risks. So Africa does need to embrace this and address this, even though it is um, the least emitter. And then on the other hand, there's the flip side of that equation, which I find quite exciting, which is that there is actually, Africa is a carbon sink. So it's actually helping to um, take carbon out of the atmosphere. And that's an opportunity, especially as we get deeper into carbon accounting that the African continent can explore. Um, so all of this are the dynamics that are at play in terms of just looking at the economic system in a slightly different way. Um, going forward. Yes, if I can add something, I, I just wanted to remind you of a chart I show you in my first lecture where we uh, I divided capital in Africa in three categories. So, so what is built up capital, so machinery, infrastructure, human capital, people, and then natural capital. And uh, of course, in Africa, traditional nothing, natural capital is a big chunk of total wealth of total capital, but uh, actually the decline in total wealth that Africa has uh, experienced uh, in the last 20 years uh, is mostly to be attributed to the decline in natural capital. And, uh, and so this is, uh, this is a concern, okay, Those, which is an economic concern. 
Yeah, and that, that to pick up on the third question that's on here about how can the agricultural bank create disclosure at the um, the extent to which um, natural resource depletion is uh, and the consequences of natural resource depletion um, for future economic development, sustainable development is understood is far less than the extent to which the effects of climate change are understood. Now, the two things are very closely related, of course, but they're not they're not the same thing. And so the, there's a you know a kind of a, a presumption that agriculture will continue to yield what it's all what it's what it's always yielded uh, is an incredibly naive assumption. Um, and the need to um, to overcome that assumption is is data related. It, it's about getting people to understand um, not just the climate related impacts, but 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 other uh, the soil degradation and and um, um, uh, agrochemical uh, use and so on. Uh, water, uh, overuse of water, all the other things that are causing um, what causing prospective disruption in, in agricultural supply chains. These things need to be well understood. Only if they are well understood do you then get adequate investment in them. Uh, and so to Ndidi's point about uh, attracting finance into Africa, um, making clear to, uh, to consumers, investors and others who ultimately are dependent upon the resources that Africa provides that there is this vulnerability, um, and that the and that the the consequences of, of not paying attention to this vulnerability are uh, are existential. These these things are uh, you know, disclosure is 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 critical to to um, to understanding that and to attracting finance to do something about it. Okay, um, what is the economic importance of greenhouse gases in oil producing communities? Um, well, there's a new story today. I don't know if you've seen this of the um, the, the, the chair of, of COP, who is also the chief executive of the um, of the Abu Dhabi uh, National Oil Company, um, uh, arrange, arranging uh, private meetings to promote oil and gas alongside. They're using COP as an opportunity for private meetings to promote oil and gas. Now, um, it would be tempting to say, "Well, this is, you know," and 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 his response is, "Private meetings are private," and you know, it, it would be tempting to say, "Well, this is this is outrageous, this is unreasonable, this is," unreasonable. but actually, um, if you're Abu Dhabi and you've, you're rich in oil reserves, wh why why wouldn't you do that? And and you know, share me any country in the world with oil reserves, my own country included, that that isn't seeking to maximize the, their value, um, and you know, even the sort of the. the, the you know, the, the, the Norways of this world, right? And so, um, so there's, there's clearly a problem of, of um, a conflict between economic self-interest and, and collective interest. Having said that, um, if you're a country like um, uh, Abu Dhabi or, or uh, another country in that region, um, then your economy is, is incredibly heavily dependent upon oil production and to the extent that the world is moving off oil production which it is ultimately um you have to find a way of transitioning your economy economy to 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 have some other basis of sustenance or else you've got populations of cities in the desert with no means of of um of well-being so the the the, the imperative for a sustainability transition is actually much greater for those current economies more heavily dependent on oil than it is for economies, um, well, that, like the UK is a good example, actually, where oil is significant, but by no means dominant. So actually, the, the need for a credible transition plan um, for an oil producing uh, community is in many ways higher and greater than it is for a non-oil producing community, I would say. I mean, I think, Richard, in addition to that, and that kind of flows also into the agriculture question slightly, there are always these big questions about just transition which is a very big part of, so as we address climate needs, we also have to take into cognizance the socio and economic consequences, that's one. Secondly, the reason for transition plans is really important. Nobody's expecting everybody to get to net zero today, their net zero plans. So really what the sustainability related disclosures are trying to do is to encourage you to have one scenario analyses and two transition plans. And obviously with these disclosures to actually have an attract the required investments to invest in that transition. So that's the one of the moves we're trying to, to, to not trying to, but trying to 
ensure that there's enough decision useful information to allow for such investments to flow. And one of the big challenges that Africa has is just the lack of data. So if you don't have the data, then there's no visibility on those transition plans and the direction of travel, which makes it very, very difficult to invest. So on top of poor sovereign risk ratings, which anyway makes it very difficult for companies in Africa to attract capital. In addition to that, the lack of data means that you get the worst possible credit risk rating, which also makes it difficult to attract capital. So what we're encouraging is sustainability related and climate related disclosures transition plans and have scenario analysis that show the pathway towards transitions. Um, also because if I jump to agriculture for a second, if we don't address this, what happens is agricultural yields, as Richard said, keep going further and further down. But even there, there's the big question of one, just transition, socioeconomic considerations. But secondly, also because we're requiring scope three, because you talked about in that question about stakeholders and clients, which are a lot of very, very small entities in some instances. It's very important that we, and there you can use technology essentially to create estimations. But again, it's a question of, do we have and can we invest in the appropriate data so that we can actually evaluate those risks, be conscious of those risks and prepare them and present them as sustainability and climate related disclosures alongside financial statements so that you can attract the capital flows required for the investment in the transition. Okay, let me move to the there's a question about cost, which I think is a really is is a really important question, widely asked everywhere, by the way. Um and um and it, so the question is complying with these standards will impose additional costs on companies. Um everybody is concerned about this. Um and some companies are more able to bear that cost than others, um, and and those least able to bear it, of course, more concerned about this. Um, especially more concerned if, it, if, in some sense, it becomes a game of, of resources, right? The more resource that you have, the better off you have, in some sense. And um, so, and we perpetuate the existing economic privilege in that way. So, the cost issue is a really important one. So, uh, complying will impose additional costs, including training, data collection, accounting, verification, auditing. Um, beyond adopting and enforcing the standards by African countries, what incentives? are there for companies to comply voluntarily sooner rather than later? Um, so it's a, it's a really good question. So I, I would say um, two things here. Firstly, um, focus on the business case for doing this, right? So um, good reporting, good sustainability reporting to our standards should be uh, beneficial to the company, right? So if you think about financial accounting, um, if a company did not do it's, it did not do financial accounting, did not do external financial reporting, um, it would not raise money on capital markets. So whether it's mandatory or not, right? Um, investors would not invest in a company where they did not know, in a reliable way, how much money it made and what what level of debt it carried, and so on and so forth. So. Think about sustainability reporting in the same way. It's in the best interest of a company to, to do financial accounting in order that it can attract investment. So think about sustainability reporting as you're doing it if it is helpful in that way and don't do it if it's not, right, from a voluntary point of view. Um, bear in mind that um, companies uh, down your supply chain will be increasingly demanding uh, uh, sustainability report related data from you um, and they will favor companies who are able to supply data over companies that are not able to supply data right I mean that's inevitably um, so that's the first the first point is, is think about the, the business case the reason why it's helpful the second thing again is to emphasize the importance of estimation um, so produce something right um so think about um you know industry level data um there is and by the way the quality of data and oh, the lights going again the quality of data um will um hang on. there we go um the quality of data will improve dramatically over time um but there's already considerable data available at an industry level um, for example, that will allow you to, to, to give a, a, a ballpark number, an estimate. You know, I am in this kind of a business, in this kind of a location, 
um, which means that my emissions are something like this, or which means that my, well, yeah, pick, pick another metric, my fresh water consumption is something like this. Um, and that's what that that's the information that's most needed. So don't think this of this as necessarily a hugely costly and time consuming exercise. Um, it should be an exercise that's proportional to the size of your entity and therefore should not impose a burden that is disproportionate to, to a smaller business than to a larger business or to a business that has done less work in this space as opposed to one that's done more work in this space. And I just wanted to add to that, Richard. I mean, into the standards we have built, because we've received this feedback, S1 and S2, we received 1,400 comment letters and a significant number of those from African jurisdictions who asked exactly the same question. So baked into the standards is the concept of on, without undue cost and effort, and also taking into cognizance the skills, resources, and capabilities of the entities that are reporting. So for example, scenario analysis allows you to begin with qualitative information and work your way towards quality, quantitative data. That's one. Secondly, actually, we have about five jurisdictions on the continent who have adopted, um, who have declared their intention to adopt the standards and have established working groups with whom they're deciding when exactly these standards will be adopted. And that's exactly what the webinar tomorrow is about, about the same time. We have three countries represented, Kenya, Nigeria, and South Africa, who will be talking about their journey to adoption and will include two preparers, MTN and Cecil, who are talking about how they are overcoming exactly these challenges regarding costs and training. And of course, the IAASB is leaning on the ISSB standards to build assurance so that there are also standards to guide assurance because there's no point in having data that is not verifiable. But your point is very well taken. It's something we're constantly thinking about. It's also the reason why we've invested so heavily in capacity building and the knowledge hub to make it you know, easier for everyone to grasp. And as Richard said, estimations and estimates and leveraging technology for that to get you started is a very key way forward. So um, there's a really good question here. Considering Africa is largely impacted by actions of emitters outside the continent, how can these standards be used to mitigate this? Um, so um, if you think about it, you know, just, just thinking about climate and climate related impact here, because it's the easiest way to illustrate this. So if you have um, transparent disclosure of the impact on Africa of the actual of global warming and the implications of that for the, the agricultural supply chain is the obvious example. So if you if you if you get good reporting from the agricultural supply chain, which feeds downstream into food producers and restaurants, where whoever the ultimate end consumer is, and those data make clear the uh, the increasing risks associated with the, with the food supply chain that are created by climate impacts or that are created by um, by other external impacts coming coming from ultimately from that uh, end demand, um, then you create the transparency for action downstream. So it's not so to be clear, this isn't. Um, you know, there's, there's not much value in uh, in an, a, an African business with low impact reporting on its impact, right? Because there isn't much to, to report on and that's not going to make much difference, right? The impact has to be downstream at the consumption end, but that requires an understanding of how the impact is affecting uh, it, it, the dependent, ultimately the dependencies of the entities themselves. You see what I mean? So it's about understanding... Um, how the value creating opportunities in the major consumers are affected by their own actions uh, upstream. Do you, want, do you want to add to that, Ndidi, or is that, is that I'm I'm just making gonna, sense? I just want to read a comment that was made in the chat as well. I'm going to put that, which, was a, which actually answers this. And the comment says, I do not think we should think about climate change and its mitigation in zero sum terms of Africa emitting less and suffering more consequences. We can think of it in terms of opportunities and how to tap into the renewable energy value yeah. chain. Um, I just thought it was an interesting add-on. Yeah, so the, the example that I just gave would be um, Western, uh, so, you know, so not glo global North consumers um, having uh, great leak creating global warming or whatever other sort of, you know, through the environment, through the agriculture supply chain, creating 
depletion of fresh water, depletion, depletion of soil and everything else without being full, without the information about that being fully transparent. The transparency comes from the, from the reporting by companies the, the, in, in, the, in the upstream. The upstream reporting is, is reported by the, 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 the major producers, the major suppliers, because that's part of their mandatory reporting, their SCO3 upstream, as it were. They report it. Um, the problem is, is recognized as an economic problem for them. Because it's an economic problem for them, there is an investment opportunity for them upstream. So the, the, the loop has to close in that way, it seems to me. And so whether that's renewable energy, whether that's agriculture, whatever it happens to be. Um, okay, I probably missed this, but will African countries be expected to bid for funds from investors directly? Um, indeed, you're better off answering this than I am in terms of you know, channels for, this is a question from Amina, a uh, question of, of channels by which funding is, is achieved. I'm just looking for the question. Um, I probably, okay. Um, I mean, FIRS, I guess it means IFRS, each of them each of them by leveraging on this influence with some of these investors. The IFRS is a standard setter. And so our objective is really to create one common language, one set of comparable, verifiable standards and a set of disclosures regarding climate and general sustainability related risks and opportunities. And our belief is that this decision useful information is actually what investors require in order to channel capital flows. Like you know, right now there are about 600 voluntary standards and that just doesn't really help in terms of channeling investment decisions. So what we're genuinely hoping, hoping, especially for the African continent with the proportionality measures and transitional reliefs that we can get these standards deployed without undue cost of an effort, recognizing the different skills, capabilities and resources of the entities that are complying, and that as a result of additional information, better information, and more visibility in terms of the data that we will be able to provide you with the platform to be more visible to investors and attract these capital flows. Especially, and there's a question in the chat which I thought was interesting, and I'll just read it, um, Richard, for you. Africa being a net carbon sink, because that speaks to this question as well, mm -hmm. is still mm -hmm. not benefiting or actively engaged in opportunities to generate income from being a net sink. How can African companies bridge that gap to generate additional income, which may also enhance their social responsibility and poverty redu reduction in the local communities they operate in? Do you want to give it a stab, Richard? Yeah, I mean, I think so. Um... This is true for you know, tropical forest in general. Um, the issue of the, the value of the carbon sink not being something that has hitherto been, been tradable in, adequately, the property right not being sufficiently well established and so on. So um, what we're seeing, and partly as, as a result of, of uh, reporting and of net, net zero commitments, and those net zero commitments having to be justified and backed up, uh, is, growing, is growing markets to, to acquire carbon credits for which um, places that are net carbon sinks are well placed, right? So, um, so that is a kind of that's a reporting on. It's an unusual case in the sense that it's reporting on a on a positive environmental impact and making that more transparent. Um, there was um, a question right above that about lithium mining. Um, now, if I understand, it's a it's, it's quite a complex question, but if I understand the question, if you're so. Now, clearly, you need to, you know, for a renewable future, you need to mine lithium and you need to mine copper and, and, and other such things that enable uh, electricity um, uh, power generation. Um, the actual act of mining lithium is not an environmentally friendly act, right? But if you're a business which is a, which is um, which is acquiring lithium, then uh, then you do need disclosure of impacts from your supplier in order that ultimately you can be accountable for it right so you know if you uh, if you supply lithium without disclosure of whether it's human rights impact or whether it's deforestation or whether it's carbon emissions or whatever is associated with with that mining activity um then ultimately there is no accountability for those external costs if you're the the um you know, suppose you're the you're, you're the automaker that is using the battery that has lithium in it. Ultimately, 
then you need to be justifying your sale of that car um, in in the transparent knowledge of the information of all of those impacts. So the chances of you reinvesting in um, you know what, what name pick whichever of the above impacts I've just described, but the chances of you investing in those um, at source is much higher if there's transparent disclosure of those impacts at source, because you ultimately the the car manufacturer are responsible for them because you're you know, you're selling the car in the end. Um, Richard, I'm guessing that you're not reading the chat because mindful of people's time, we're two minutes to closure. There's still a number okay. of questions we haven't yes. answered. Is there, is, there, is, there any, is there any particular one that jumps out that we should try to get across? So we'll collect the questions, log them, um, and hopefully see you tomorrow at the session yeah. where we're... Um, and let them, I mean, let me just, just end with a... And I've, I've, been, I've been stressing um, how much this is a, an emerging field um, and, and how much the need is to is to is to estimate and to get on with it um, and to to to, uh, to to do what you can proportionately to the resources that you have. And I would say this is true for for all of us, right? So um, sustainability is inherently an interdisciplinary space. It's inherently a space in which we need to make progress in the face of, of incomplete knowledge. And so um, you know, I'm very mindful doing this with and DD and Nicole that my knowledge is is not in the same space. As, as hers in the context of these seminars, but that's no reason not to be getting on with it, right? Because this is hugely important stuff and, and sharing information and, and, and learning together and, and uh, making mistakes and learning from them is incredibly important in this space. I think that I, I think we need to stop. So let me, we've we got just one minute left to, to, uh, to tee up the session, uh, the next session, I think. Is that right? Do we have a slide for the for the fourth of our final sessions? Here we go. So tune in tomorrow. We have we have an all star cast for this, um, and uh, I, I, they, they need they need no introduction. So there's deep expertise uh, on this panel, uh, which which uh, Andidi has been able to pull together for us. So I do think you'll be able to make this for um, for a, a, a finale to these four sessions. I hope that's been helpful, and I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thank mm -hmm. you.